Good morning to everyone. This is my debut opportunity to have a full sermon for you. I hope it uh, is very beneficial for you, very informative, that you will be edified and that you will walk away with information that you possibly didn't have before and that will benefit you greatly. <clears throat> have you ever heard the expression that opportunity only knocks once? I'd say we've all heard that before. In, uh, and in many cases that, that expression holds true. You take uh, Bill Gates for instance, he's one of the richest men in the world. And he would tell you the reason why is he was in the right place at the right time. And he took the opportunity. He seized the opportunity. But today, how many of us today <clears throat> take advantage of the opportunities that we have? A lot of us have a lost opportunities. We have lost a lot of opportunities in our lifetimes. I would adventure to say this is a, a daily occurrence. The opportunities that we do not take advantage of that are lost and gone forever. You, uh, you remember Aesop's fables? The fable of the grasshopper and the ants? The grasshopper's wandering around with his fiddle, making music all the time, and just having a good, joyous time, having a great life. He comes across this group of ants that are drying their seeds and what have you in the sunshine, getting ready for winter. And he comes across them and he says, I'm hungry, could, uh, could you give me something to eat? What have you been doing? Why haven't, haven't you laid up anything for store for winter? Haven't you been preparing? Haven't you made ready? No, I've been wandering around, playing my fiddle, making music. Okay, you made music, now dance. So they turned their back on the grasshopper and he went away hungry. The moral of this story is there's opportunities there that we have to take advantage of. We need to be ready all the time. There's a time to work, there's a time to play. We have to decide which is which and which is more important to us. If we fail to take advantage of the opportunities when they're available, they'll be gone forever. Those opportunities most likely will never come back. So it's our responsibility to take those opportunities when they come. We see this principle taught in Galatians 10, 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We have a responsibility as Christians to look and watch for the opportunities. Like I say, they come on a daily basis. They're always out there. But are we ever watching? Do we ever look for those opportunities? That's our responsibility. And if we have responsibility and we have ability then we have to make sure we take that opportunity and teach the people. And we need to realize that right now is the only time that we have to teach. One day our time's going to be over. But right now we have the 
the time to teach, to t take advantage of those opportunities while it's still today. John 9, 4, Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is today. Or while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. While it is day. While it is this day. That opportunity ar arises this day. Not tomorrow, this day. That night's coming, no one will be working. No one will be doing it. Jesus is our master example. And we see, see the importance in using our opportunities every single day. Not just one day, but every day. Proverbs 3.27 do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back tomorrow, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Don't put an opportunity you have today over till to tomorrow. You have it with you? Do it. Take advantage of the opportunity. Especially if it's a spiritual opportunity. You have the ability and the opportunity to teach someone. You have the responsibility. That day. Tomorrow may not come. So don't put it off till tomorrow. It may not be here. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So we're not to withhold the good for those around us. We take advantage of those opportunities. Another reason we need to take advantage of our opportunities is today is we don't know if there will be a tomorrow. Nobody can sit here and say for sure that there will be a tomorrow. James 4.13 Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. That's how fleeting life is. It's a vapor. It appears just for a small time and then it vanishes away. I always thought if I ever did a sermon on a timeline or whatever, if I would take a string and hook it to that wall and to that wall and call that a hundred years and put a black dot on there of your lifespan, well, it might fill the whole thing. But if you make that a thousand years, well, now you're down to a tenth of it. If you make an eternity, you're not a speck on that line. That's how fleeting your life is. That's how fast it goes. Take advantage of your opportunities today. Tomorrow may not be here for you. So there's a real urgency for every Christian to do God's will today. And not put it off till tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. Matthew 6.34 Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Isn't that the truth? You worry about the things that you got going on today, you don't even think about tomorrow. You'll spend all your time worrying about the things that you have going on today. 
especially if you're trying to spread God's word, especially if you're trying to teach people and taking care in, of the opportunities that come your way, you'll have no time to even think about tomorrow. There's one opportunity that we don't want to lose is warning non-Christians and those who have fallen away from the dangers of not being right with God. Ezekiel 3.17 Son of man, I have, not, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. How important is it for us to warn people of the dangers of not being right with God? If you have the opportunity to warn somebody that you know that is not right with God and you do not do it, how horrible can that be for you later? God says, I will require his blood at your hand. Let's see, she have it on. Yeah, Colossians 1 8. This is a uh, New Testament example of Paul giving, uh, making warning, making sure that people are aware. Colossians 1 8. That's not right. 128, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to start at verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. In Christ Jesus. So that warning people was not just an Old Testament principle. It's New Testament as well. So this falls to us. We need to warn people. Acts 20, 27, or 26 Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. He didn't leave anything out. He taught everything. He didn't... Um, we take advantage of our opportunities, we teach. We teach everyone that we can. And we teach them the whole counsel of God. And when you look at some of the preachers on TV, you're going to get a watered down version of the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ. You're going to get what they think you want to hear that will keep you in the seats, that will keep you coming. That's not what Paul taught. Paul taught the whole counsel of God, and that is the scary side as well as the loving side. Now, I know there's preachers on TV that will never teach you about hell or the dangers of it, 
Are you falling into it? But that's the whole counsel of God. You need to be taught that because if that isn't real, why do I need to warn you? Why do I need to teach you? That's what we warn you of. Right, another concept of touching or of teaching others around us is Matthew ten fourteen, where it says, And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. I hope everybody doesn't have this problem, but most people, when we try to teach, there's always somebody that doesn't really want to hear it. They always just brush you off. Nah, I don't want to hear it today. Maybe another day. Don't, not, not right now. So you try and you try and you try, and sooner or later it gets to where, okay, now, now I have to go somewhere else. I mean, you want them to learn the gospel, you want them to obey the gospel, and you want that badly. But now it's time to say that you need to go somewhere else. Don't give up on them entirely. The opportunity comes around where they ask you about it, then you take that opportunity to teach them, continue to teach them. But you need to branch out Use your other opportunities to save other people. We need to expand and reach out and find new opportunities with other people. Paul put this into practice in Acts 18.5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So there's that blood reference again. Paul didn't shun to tell them about the whole counsel of God. He didn't give them a watered down version. He said, But now that you denied it, your blood will be upon your own heads. It will not be on mine. The Jews were Paul's people. He could relate to them real good. Paul was a very devout Jew. But the Jews resisted God over and over and over again. So Paul went to the Gentiles instead. And he had great success in converting the Gentiles. Another thing we don't want to have lost opportunities in is serving God. Matthew 5, or 25, starting at verse 31. You know, you think about it, after all, we're going to be judged on how we serve God on this earth. Matthew 25, starting at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory, and all the angels will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, As surely I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, 
into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and its angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. They will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or stranger or naked, sick in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of these least one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we're going to be judged on how we live on this earth, how we live our godly lives, how we take advantage of the opportunities that are, that are before us. These opportunities that he's talking about here is not only to teach, but it's to do good, thirsty, to feed people, to give them drink if they need it, clothe them, whatever they need. He's talking about the brethren. We have a responsibility there. Jesus makes it very clear that on Judgment Day, our eternal destination is going to depend on how we serve God. And part of that is going to be on how we treated our brethren. And when you really stop and think about <clears throat> what Jesus said, it should really make you think twice about how you treat your brethren. You think about it, if Jesus was here in this room right now, what would your focus be on? What he's wearing? How he's dressed? How he looks? How his hair's combed? What his shoes look like? After services, would you make an effort to go up and talk to him? See what his life's been like? See what, see what he has to say? I would hope that all of us would desire to talk to him. I mean, he is Jesus after all. Everybody should have questions for Jesus. Since Jesus told us what we need to do to our brethren, shouldn't we have the same outlook and the same desire for brothers and sisters in Christ? Let me give you another example here. In Acts 9.3, this is Saul on his way to Damascus. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Was Paul persecuting Jesus? He couldn't have been. Jesus was in heaven. So Paul couldn't be directly persecuting Jesus. But indirectly, he was persecuting Christians. And Jesus said, As whatever you do to one of these, even to the least of these, you're doing to me. So we need to uh, bear that in mind, especially the next time we might be thinking about something we want to do to one of our brethren or say to one of our brethren or, or whatever. Let's keep that in mind. When we do that, we're doing it directly to Jesus. So when you're standing there talking to your brother or your sister, picture Jesus standing right beside them. Now what do I really have to say? What do I really want to do? It's going to affect both, all three of you. Another thing we don't want to do is lose opportunities and remaining prepared for Judgment Day. Matthew 25. Then the king, kingdom of heaven shall be likened ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps 
and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should be not, not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So the five foolish virgins in the parable represent those who are kind, committed to God, even though they knew what the master knew that the master would be coming. And of course, just as the virgins, we don't know when the master will return, and we learn from the parable that there's a great need to stay prepared. For the master could, could, could return any day. So that's the importance of taking the advantage of the opportunities while it's still today. There's a great need for us to continually be prepared for Jesus' return. When we're prepared, we're living a faithful life to God every single day. That's our job as Christians. You don't want to be like the five foolish virgins. Have the door shut on you. Say, go away. I never knew you. This includes studying God's word, prayer, attending every worship service we can, doing good to others, loving God enough to obey his commands. If we are not committed to serving God with our whole heart, we may find ourselves being like the five virgins who are not prepared. We don't want that. You know, every now and then, we need to ask ourselves, am I prepared to meet the Lord today? If he comes today, am I ready? That's a very important question. And you know who knows the answer to that? You do. Only you do. You and God. Am I doing what I can to prepare for his coming? Or am I losing my opportunities to prepare for his coming? Those opportunities are so important, they help us to prepare. So as Christians, we really, really need to take note. We really need to be aware of what we're doing on a daily basis. Very, very important. All right, so far it's been about Christians. So for the last point, we're going to, we don't want to lose this opportunity to tell the non-Christians that may be in the audience that you don't want to lose the opportunity to obey the will of God to be saved. 2 Corinthians 6.1 we then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. 
Behold, now is the day of salvation. I want you to understand this clear teaching of Paul because all you have is today. Right now, all you have is today. Today is your opportunity to become saved, to have a hope that is more precious than anything that you'll find on this earth. When you think about the peace that will be in your life, to know that you're saved and that heaven will be your home. Luke 14, 16, Jesus teaches this lesson. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I ask you, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who are invited will taste my supper. There's quite a few things that Jesus teaches in this parable, but I want to point out to you that those that were being invited to the feast at the beginning... What did they do? Oh, I want to come, but I got to go over here and do this. I just bought five oka yaks, and I got to go. Got to go see them. They made excuses, one right after the other. Made excuses. Many of the Jews in the first century rejected Christ. They had better plans, but a lot of the Gentiles accepted him. And Jesus said that those that had made the excuses will not taste of my supper. You put something before me, you're not worthy of me. Well, you know what the same thing's true today. Do you keep making excuses of why you will not become a Christian today? Ask yourself the question, what's preventing me from becoming a Christian today? If you can't think of any reason, then why not make today your day of salvation? Everybody that's saved has a day of salvation. Yours can be today. Jesus says in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he... You will die in your sins. Luke 13, 5. I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Unless you, repent, unless you change your ways, unless you change your thought process, unless you change the direction that you're going, unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. Matthew 10, 32, 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That's a confession of your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ as being the living Son of God. That's an open confession by mouth 
in front of witnesses. Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So because of your belief, because of your willingness to repent, because of the open confession that you make with your mouth, and then being baptized to wash away your sins, you can be saved. All these are things that you have to do in order to be saved, to accept the salvation from God. So if you're here, you're not a Christian, and you're willing to make this day your day of salvation, now's the time. Now is the accepted day. Now is that time. If you're here, you are a Christian, and you need to take advantage of this opportunity to correct something that's wrong in your life, some sin that you have in your life against your brethren or against the church. Now is the time to do that. We'll help you in any way possible. If this is your time, please come forward now as we stand and sing the appropriate.